This conference will now be recorded. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Delighted that you have chosen to join us for this fourth edition of our coaching call. Uh, as you know our pattern by now, I like to start off with something I'm stirred up about. And usually it's something I've been inspired by in my devotional reading, and that's exactly what's happened this morning. It was actually yesterday when I was reading a story in the Gospel of Mark, and uh, in the story, to set the context, Jesus had been preaching and healing in, in Capernaum, which is where uh, uh, Peter lived, one of his disciples, and he healed Peter's mother, and the crowds were coming, and he was like a local hero. Everywhere he went, just thronged. Well, one morning, the disciples wake up, and the throngs are already at the door. They, everybody wants to see Jesus again, but he's nowhere to be found. And they're like, what in the world? And they kind of fan out, do a all hands on deck search party, and they find Jesus alone out on the countryside. He went out there to be alone and to pray. And they said, Jesus, what are you doing? Come on, the crowds are demanding you come back. They're bringing their sick people and they want to, they want to hear you teach. And it's very interesting. Listen very carefully to what Jesus said to them. He said, let's go to the other villages. I want to preach there also because this is the reason I was sent. Now let that sink in for a moment. What it says to me is that Jesus had extreme clarity about his purpose. He knew what his job was and he wasn't going to allow anything to distract him or deter him from fulfilling that mission. And even though the good citizens of Capernaum were all very fine people and probably would have set Jesus up in a nice synagogue and provided him with all the, the comforts of life if he'd stayed and been their local preacher and healer, that, that had no appeal to Jesus whatsoever because it was out of alignment with his job. And you'll see this over and over if you read the Gospels and the story of Jesus. Everybody's always trying to get him to go over here and do this or do that or shut up or don't say this. And his response was always the same. I must do this. This is why I was sent here. This is my calling. This is my mission. This is my job. So just this morning, uh, our Abbey agent, Tom Brimer, sent me a little quotation that he found in the book, Eat That Frog, which you all know is one of my uh, favorite books of all time, written by Brian Tracy. And here was the quote from the book by a, a gentleman named Nito Quibine. I don't know, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that correctly, but here's what he said. Nothing can add more power to your life than concentrating all of your energies on a limited set of targets. In other words, don't play squirrel, you know. Oh, great opportunity over here. Oh, fun thing over here. Oh, free food at the builder's model. And we go here and there distracted, our energies diffused. This author would say, that is not a path to power. It's not a path to success because you're diffusing your energies. Instead, we should, like Jesus, be very clear about what our job is. So with that little introduction, I have a question for you. It is the question of the day. And I would like you to turn your mic on and answer if you're willing to play along. Here's the question. As a real estate sales professional, what is your job? And more specifically, because I want us to kind of all be on the same wavelength here, what is the one task or activity that more than any other will assure your long-term success and prosperity as a real estate sales professional? Think about that while I shut the door and take a drink, and then we'll hear your answers. <laughs> Okay, what is your job? Who wants to play? Why? I'll play. Um, relationship builder. 
Okay, love it. I would have expected an answer like that from you, Blythe. <laughs> a people person. Okay, very good. Thank you. Nancy, did you want to uh, pretend? Yeah. Pretend. Did you want to play? I, just, I think I know the answer. I'm not really great at it, but I think it's, you know, your database and collecting contact information. Okay, very good. Which I mean, we would describe. I think, it's, I think it's relationships too, you know, and that's one of the reasons why I have building a, a you know, the whole computer, doing an Excel spreadsheet, doing the database is just kind of difficult because I have a hard time with So that. we define a database as a list of relationships. So your answer is very much in line with Blythe's answer. Anybody else want to play? I will say being persistent and consistent. Okay. Rochelle says being persistent and consistent. I like that right? That, that kind of speaks to the squirrel syndrome. We're going to stay focused. We're going to keep doing the activities that we know are going to generate the required results, even if it takes some time to see them. All right, Mark, what's your thought? Oh, you know what, Mark, your mic is on, but we can't hear you. I see a green light, but we're not hearing your voice. Try tapping it. I mean, not tapping it, typing it in. <laughs> how about, how about oh, now? Yeah, 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 no, we got you. Go right ahead. Awesome. Uh, I was saying doing the very best I can to help people achieve their goals. Okay, very good. I certainly wouldn't argue with that. Being others focused, it's a service industry. We're here to help and to serve. Okay, I like that answer. You've got the right ethical and moral, moral foundation. I just feel like I the better I do life. that, the more likely I am to get referrals and to get real lasting business down the road. No doubt about it. Fly? I have one more that you um, said to us at a lunch about a year and a half ago, and it stuck with me that someone had told you that your main job as a real estate agent is to be an ego manager. And so I always remember that whenever I'm dealing with less than easy people. <laughs> Yes, that's certainly a required relationship skill, being able to keep egos in check and keep people focused on the goal, which is to get to the closing, not to win a battle with the buyer or the seller on the other side. Okay. Yeah, we're getting we're getting some great responses. Anybody else want to take the last shot? Obviously, I'm going to share my opinion in just a moment, and I haven't heard it yet. Everybody, every, everybody we've heard is, has been great. All those are very critical, but anybody else want to share an opinion before I kind of go down my rabbit trail? Oh, everybody's scared to speak now. Okay. okay. How about, right, how about sell houses? Sell houses? Is that our job? Sell houses. That's, that's the closest <laughs> I've heard so far. Uh, and obviously that comes from caring about people, building relationships, having a database, but ultimately you got to sell a house, right? Uh, if you're going to be in this business for the long term. And that is how I phrased that. What is the one task or activity which will more than any other assure your long term success and prosperity in this business? Here, oh, Kevin wants to go ahead, take a shot at it, Kevin. Good morning. I think it's getting into a, um, a state of flow with people so they know that I care about their real estate and I'm in relationship to them and and when the need comes it's it's getting that that situation of flow going with my peeps that's it okay I love that answer and you I, th I think been influenced a little bit by my teaching on that subject that we have to constantly send out the message that we are caring competent real estate professionals who are ready willing and able to help people with their real estate needs and when somebody has a real estate need, if that message is in front of them, because we've been very consistent in our marketing, we've got the best shot at getting that business. Okay, so I'm not saying my answer is better than anybody else's, but I want to present something that I think in my mind is crystal clear about being the one task that will more than any other assure your long-term viability in this business. And it is this, to get listings. Get listings. 
you have probably heard the expression, those who list last. And there is truth in that saying. Buyers can come and go and buyers are easier to get. That's why on the Frank Gray team, we started by focusing on getting buyers. But that's because you, you, you want to get some cash flow going, right? To pay the bills while you're building a big long-term business. It is sellers which constitute that big long-term business. And that's because well, another expression that you'll, you'll hear, there's a leverage in the listing relationship. The leverage means that if you get a listing, you're more likely to get buyers as a result of it and to get other listings as a result of it. Whereas if you get a buyer, that tends to be the end of it, unless that buyer also has a home to sell. And I know you can try to cultivate referrals from them, but listings very naturally lend themselves both on a personal referral basis and a public visibility basis to generating more business. So if I were to ask you today, hey, what is your number one job as a real estate agent? And you were to say to get listings, I would be greatly assured that you're going to make it in this business and make it big over the long term because that's the one task. And obviously we have to care about people, help them, serve them, build our database. As Blythe said, she was thinking very deeply about this and very philosophically about this. Well, I'm going, I'm going straight to the streets this morning. You know, let's get down to the dirty, nitty gritty. What does it take? Get more listings. So let's, I, I think it would be helpful to all of us if we could talk about this for a minute as a group and then we'll open it up, you know, a open forum for any questions or issues y'all want to discuss, but let's talk about it for a minute. How do we get more listings? Oh, before we do that, but let me make one more point about this. If you have a motivated, qualified buyer right now in this market, are you guaranteed a paycheck? <laughs> Well, if you've had any motivated, qualified buyers recently, you'll know you're not guaranteed a paycheck because you, you may present five, six, 10, 12 offers on different homes and not get any of them. By contrast, if you have a motivated, qualified seller in this market, are you guaranteed a paycheck? Absolutely right? Absolutely. They're going to line up to buy that home. It's probably going to be a cash offer. It's probably going to close within 21 days. You're not only going to get a paycheck, you're going to get it fast. This market that we're in dramatizes the truth of what I'm telling you. What I'm saying about getting listings is true in any market, but right now in a seller's market, you just see it more clearly, more graphically than ever before that sellers are the way to get paid. Okay, so now back to the question, what are some things we can do to get listings? Anybody wanna play? And I'm gonna write while we talk about it. Call Fizbo's. Oh, I love that. Mark says, call Fizbo's. So, and, and the reason that Mark would say that is that we know this is a homeowner who wants to sell. Right. They're advertising the fact I want to sell my home. And we know statistically the vast majority of them are going to be unsuccessful. And, and again, I, I recognize we're in a weird market right now, but statistically, 90 percent of them end up listing with an agent. All right. Who else, by the way, falls in that category of somebody that we know wants to sell their house? Expired or terminated. Listing. There, there you go. And again. Studies have shown that most expired sellers still want to sell the house. They've just grown frustrated with their agent, frustrated with the process, frustrated with having to have their home clean and ready to show all the time, but they still want to sell. So expireds and FISBOs have to be near the top of this list of how to get listings. Okay, great. How else? I guess it's tougher than I thought. 
How about, I mean, I mean, knocking on doors. I don't know. Okay. So Nancy, I'm gonna, talking to people. Okay. I'm going to come back to that. Thanks. Hold, uh, Victor, what'd you say? Banks. Banks. Go talk to banks and get their, what, their REO inventory? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's a great one. In fact, I made a little list of my own and that was not on it. Um, if you've not been following this issue, foreclosures are taking a spike up right now because the foreclosure protections under COVID have gone away. And it's kind of a shock to me because with the increase in values, I just figured people who were behind on their payments would just sell. But the fact is uh, foreclosures are dramatically spiking right now. So for, for whatever reason, these people aren't or can't sell and the banks are taking back their properties. Okay, so let me share a few ways with you. And uh, um, Letty, did you want to contribute here? Well, I was just thinking of an idea, uh, say people that are empty nesters and are probably thinking of going into a, 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 a retirement home. If, yes. if those people are starting to look, they haven't yet sold their house, they may not even have an agent. Maybe it's getting communicated with you know, or connect it with retirement places. Okay, so that is one of the general categories that I wanted to mention, which is it's fishing upstream for people who who haven't put their homes on the market, but, but are connected to people who are gonna know they're gonna need to. So it could be in a retirement community or it, where, and I lived in 55 plus, people went from that neighborhood, they went to two places. They either went to the cemetery <laughs> or they moved into assisted living. Okay. And so if you got connected with the people in the 55 plus community, both of those are going to trigger the sale of a home. And so if you can get upstream and go talk to those people before they actually have to move into assisted living, then you have a good chance of getting that listing. In that same category, I would put people like divorce lawyers and estate planning attorneys. Those people, uh, those professionals work with clients who, who are gonna need to sell a home. And yet now you're, you're still fishing upstream. This is before the clients perhaps have even interviewed agents. Your divorce attorney friend can say, hey, the Smiths are having troubles. Looks like they're gonna have to sell and it may trigger two more purchases. And based upon the attorney's recommendation, they look upon you favorably. Estate planning attorneys the same way. So think about institutionally, who knows when people are going to have to sell a home uh, before the rest of the world knows about it, okay? Here's another one, your sphere of influence. And I hate to be so obvious, but I suspect that most of the people that you know, families, friends, former coworkers, acquaintances, they live in houses and eventually they're gonna to need to sell that house. So as long, and this is, this is what Kevin brought up earlier, as you stay in front of them on a consistent basis, you're gonna be in the preferred position to get that listing. Your sphere of influence, I put, is actually your number one source of listings. As long, because they already know you like, you trust you. You may not know in advance that they're going to have a need to sell their home. And that's why you have to consistently market so that when that, that they drop into that category of real estate need, you're already there and you've been there. Sphere of influence, number one. The second key source of listings is your geo farm. And again, this is the neighborhood that you live in. That's the strategy that I teach. All those people live in houses and we know statistically they're going to move every seven years. 15% of Americans move every year. That's one out of seven. So if you're farming 70 homes, 10 of them are going to sell this year. 140, that's 20 sales. 210 homes in your neighborhood, that's 30 homes that are going on the market this year. So again, you just consistently, just like your sphere, 
consistently market to that neighborhood, host your open houses in that neighborhood, you are going to be the listing queen or the listing king of that neighborhood within a fairly short amount of time. Within just a year or two, you can achieve a dominant position. Nobody brought this up, so I'm going to. The third source on my list of how you get listings is market for sellers on social media. And there's some very straightforward ways to do that. In fact, KV Core makes that so simple just by creating landing pages uh, that say things like, what's your home worth? And you can make cute little posts on Instagram or on Facebook. Certainly you've heard that home values have risen 30% in the Houston market within the last uh, 12 months. What is your home worth today? Click here to get an instant automated answer based upon recent comparable sales. KV Core makes that so easy. Not every person who clicks it is actually interested in selling. Some may just be curious about what their home is worth, but a, but a significant portion of them are considering selling. So target market sellers in your social media. Number four, I have on my list, the one that Mark brought up earlier, target FISBOs and expires. Number five, and this one is a, a little bit off the beaten path, but I've shared it before and, I, and I'm gonna say before I even introduce it, when I was an active selling agent, it was my most powerful, effective way of getting new listings. So let this sink in. I would get buyers for a neighborhood, and this was before I had KV Core. But now with Core Property Boost, it's so easy to get a list of buyers for a neighborhood. Then I would send a postcard to the neighborhood saying, I have 17 families who want to move into this neighborhood and they cannot find a home. And all your neighbors will immediately understand that, right? Because the homes get snapped up so quickly. If you're thinking about selling your home anytime within the next year, please call me because I already have the buyers. I may be able to save you thousands in realtor fees. And now it doesn't matter if their cousin, brother, nephew, Sunday school teacher has a real estate license. They're not going to save them thousands. You're the one who has the buyer and is going to save them thousands. And that's going to trump all other loyalties. Okay, very, very powerful. Run a core property boost on your neighborhood. It's gonna generate, even at the lowest level, five, six, seven leads. Uh, take a picture of one of those families in front of a home with the cardboard sign. Please help us find our new home in Apple Valley and mail that out to the entire neighborhood, okay? I promise you, your phone will ring with homeowners whose homes are not currently for sale, not listed but they're very interested if you've got a buyer and can save them thousands, okay? All right, number six on my list, I already mentioned them before, uh, divorce attorneys, estate planning attorneys, um, as, uh, as Letty brought up, 55 plus communities, anybody institutional or professional who can have advanced notice of people who are going to need to sell. And then Nancy, I promised you I would come back to what you brought up earlier. You used the phrase knock on doors. And I want to say that one of the most powerful ways to get listings is to schedule an open house and then go knock on the nearest 50 doors. I actually watched a video this morning from a, a top producing agent somewhere else in the country. And his strategy was to knock, every time he held an open house, he would knock on the nearest 200 doors. Now that that's several hours of work, I know, because I used to time it, how long it would take me to go door to door to door. At a minimum 50, at max 200, but you have an open house flyer, you go knock on the door, if nobody answers, you move on. You don't leave a flyer, you just move on. If they answer, you introduce yourself, telling them you're, you're hosting an open house on the home for sale down the street, invite them to come take a look, Ask them if they know anybody who's interested in buying in the neighborhood because the homes are selling so quickly. If they know someone, you might be able to get them in there very quickly and put them in a preferred position to make an offer. 
invite them to come. And what's going to happen when you do that is that these homeowners who are thinking about selling are going to start talking about it. And they're going to say things to, to you like, well, uh, I've never known of another agent to do what you're doing, you know, going door to door, aggressively marketing the home. Well, what, what, what could you do for my house? How much do you think I could get? How long would it take to sell my house? They're going to be naturally curious and you just appear at their door ready to answer their questions. So don't discount the power of an open house, which we typically think as a buyer source to become a seller source, if you will knock on at least the nearest 50 doors with an invitation. So there we go. Those are my top seven ways to do your number one job, which is to get listings as well as some great ideas shared by others. Um, anything else on this discussion before we open up the phone lines? How do you how do you feel? And it's okay. I, I would love your opinion. How do you feel about my contention that the number one task to assure your longevity and prosperity in this business is to get listings? Are you on board with that, or do you have another idea? Got a thumbs up from Kip. I see some nods. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Mark. I really am open to uh, to differing opinions. Sometimes, you know, when that happens, we uh, we all learn something. All right. Letha is on board. Absolutely. Nancy. So <clears throat> I got a couple of emails. I have the SFR designation, and I'm wondering if that's how they got my information. But I got an email. Um, saying that if I wanted to participate in the REO, you know, with different banks and stuff, that there were some <clears throat> people that we could use. And I wrote them down in my car. I joined the seminar, the, the webinar in my car because anyway, and um, so I didn't have a chance to really write down all the information, but they don't send it out. But I did get another one and there's another one coming today that I, I was going to join at about 11. <clears throat> but I just wanted to ask you about that because, you know, I'm new and yeah. I'm always the one to jump on everything, you know, so yes. I'm, just, I'm curious so, if like that's a good idea because it gives us a lot of different um, entities that are wanting realtors to help. So SFR stands for short sales and foreclosures. Yeah. Um, and, and what it, it's a designation, advanced training to help you assist distressed sellers, distressed homeowners. Um, I have the designation myself, um, got it many years ago, and I think it is very helpful. I, you use the word Nancy curious, and I think that's a good word. You should be curious to see about these entities that are offering to help to connect you either with financial institutions who need somebody to represent them on REOs or provide you with lists of distressed sellers, people who are behind on their mortgage payments in a pre-foreclosure status so you can reach out to them. But the other C word that I think you need to adopt is cautious. And the reason for that is I suspect most of these people marketing to you right now are hoping to sell you a service that may or may not have value. And if I told this story last week, forgive me, um, but it's, it's worth retelling. I had a friend who uh, ran a bait company. He literally manufactured fishing lures and baits. And uh, I was at his home one day looking at his molds and he had, he had one of his lures and it, I mean, it just looked, you know, like an Indian headdress, feathers and bangles and bells and everything. And I looked at it and I said, oh my goodness, will this really catch a fish? And he said, I don't know, but it'll catch a fisherman. Ah, so a lot of these companies, they may not have any good information to sell you, but all they're trying to do is catch you. They're, they're trying to catch an agent and part you from your money. So that doesn't mean there's not some opportunity there. Um, I, I think it's good to be curious, attend the webinar, listen to what they have to say, but also be very cautious. Ask for referrals, recommendations, agents that you can reach out to who are using the service. Ask the hard questions before you give them a credit card number. 
Well, so the reason I asked is because uh, he mentioned banks earlier. One of our one of the people that were on on here said to look yes. at banks. Yes. So I'm just curious about that. So yeah. maybe you could talk a little bit more about how that would work. Sure. So I've known a number of agents in my career who've made a great living representing financial institutions as the listing agent on their REOs, their real estate owned property. Those are properties they've taken back in foreclosure. But for everyone who's made a great living, a hundred others have tried. It, it is kind of a good old boys network among financial institutions. They kind of have their favorite people that they use and have always used, it's hard to break into. That does not mean it's impossible and it doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Investigate it, be curious, but again, just be cautious. Yes, Kevin? I'll tell you what, I wish that when I started this business, there had been a, a, an 11th commandment, which is thou shalt not sign up for nothing because <laughs> Holy moly, the, the trek list of new agents has got to be the fisherman lure uh, yes. bonanza of the year, right? But a gold line. I'll, I'll give you a, a tip that comes from that, and that is you ever get these uh, little Visa gift cards? Get a Visa gift card with about 10 bucks on it. And if you ever do have to sign up for something that's on a subscription basis, use that. And it will not auto renew because it'll run out of funds in very short order. And if in fact you absolutely want to keep that service, well then, oh yeah, my card changed. But if not, it does not go on because uh, let's say that I've had some of those and, and I don't wish that on anyone. And, and I concur what you're saying. These things will catch a fisherman. These things will catch a realtor. And, um, and, and it's not the money as much as it is the distraction. I mean, it's, it's shiny object syndrome and we, we it, in, in, in writ large in, in my life, but that's a, just a tip, the gift card. Yeah, and that was worth the price of admission. I'd never thought of that, Kevin. Would have saved me a fortune over the years. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so it's open forum at this point. Anybody have an issue you wanna put on the table for input or discussion? Uh, contracts, lead generation, difficult client experience. What's going on, Nancy? I do, and I'll tell you why, because uh, just like yesterday, we were going through, and I'm so thankful for that class yesterday. It was so good um, because, again, I've got two people who want to list their property. One who's really dragging his feet. At first, we were looking um, to, we were looking at houses, and he he kind of got spooked when we were talking about money and a lender and stuff so then he was like well maybe we should sell my house first so then he was like well it's not clean you know my boys make a mess blah 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 and so i've been saying well you know i'm happy to come over and help you um you know i and I, the main thing i really want to do is get that form and i was thinking maybe that form where it's like people can kind of list out whatever stuff that they need you know fixed or what or what's going on with the house you know the the form that you have to fill out for mls it just gives them a perspective oh well maybe i need to look at this but anyway th so that one and then i have this other one he's ready he wants to buy some land they're ready to sell the house and he works a lot so my question to you is because you know they want to get the ball rolling whether they're busy or a lazy or just you know, whatever it is, how do you get to the table? Because I know they want to sell their house and just, I, I, I don't want to say the wrong thing. You know, I don't want to talk too much. I don't want to text them too much. I'm just, okay. you, know, oh, yeah. the, you see what I'm saying? I do. So, so one thing I would caution you and everybody else is don't believe what people say. Believe what people do. And the way that you gauge somebody's motivation, motivation to sell, motivation to buy, is that they act like a motivated seller. They act like a motivated buyer. How does a motivated seller act? They start cleaning up the house. They do the touch-up painting. They get the landscaping ready. They start packing and, and clearing clutter. That's, that's a motivated seller. Somebody who says, oh, I really want to sell, and they take none of those actions, uh, they're not a motivated seller. They may think they are. They may have deceived themselves, but actions do not lie. So, okay, you're, so 
well, let me just tell you about this other one that was listing. Okay, so they packed all their stuff. They got everything out. They put it all in the garage. This is that one. I know you remember the one that um, I had a, had got him a house. And it was that one that Stephanie had listed on Pine Lake. Yes. And um, we, he was ready to sell. He's also got another property where he's building. So I know he's going to sell. I know he wants a little investment property for the side. And I know that he's building a property. So how do I get him? Because he's always talking about for sale by owner. He's one of those who yeah. does his homework. He's always digging into. Great. You know what so I'm saying? Let me address that. So you'll you'll have a very frustrating life and career if you see your role as to motivate people. Uh, motivation is internal, not external. So don't feel like you're dropping the ball if you can't get them to move okay no movement comes from inside your role as a real estate sales professional is to act essentially as a consultant to provide information regarding the decision that they have to make the goal that they're trying to accomplish so let's say in the example of this second one he's got to sell his house and he wants to buy an investment property well get got out of the way and want to out of the way those are motivational words just listen to what he said and then start providing information that will be helpful so in the case of the seller that information could be current market value uh, e even more important a, a a pricing trends report on homes in his neighborhood so he can see the direction maybe he'll see some flattening off of values or maybe and i saw this somebody oh it was trina hoffman in her farming presentation did year on year comparisons of the best time to sell a home and very consistently prices peaked in may and she made the point so you want to be on the market in april that's the kind of information that you can share with people. I know you're considering selling your house, your building is not going to be ready for four or five months or whatever, but here's some information that I ran on your neighborhood that's kind of interesting. It shows if we go on the market in about six weeks, you're going to maximize your opportunity to get the most money out of your home. In fact, it's the peak period for selling out of the entire 12 months. So you're not motivating them. You're just providing them the information that could enable them to motivate themselves. And if you've got a buyer and an investor buyer is the least motivated buyer you're ever going to find. Why? Because they don't have to buy. They already have a roof over their head. Their family is settled. Nobody's being transferred. So for them, it is purely a financial decision. When the stars align, they have available cash and credit, and the opportunity arises that meets their investment criteria, they're going to purchase. So again, your role as a consultant is to provide them opportunities that line up with their criteria. So I would have a conversation with an investor client. Go deep, be curious, go back to the C word again. Find out what their investment goals are. Are they trying to do a fix and flip? Are they doing a buy and hold? Are they building a large portfolio that they just want one, two or three? Do they want them in the neighborhood so it's easier for them to service or they don't care because they're going to hire a property management company? Have this conversation. And then once you know what price range they want to be in, uh, what type of home they want, a three bedroom, two bath, no pool, good school district, um, they want uh, properties in a neighborhood that have been proven to cash flow, beat the 1% rule. Once you know, then you just, you do your work. You go find them properties and present them to them. And if you present them with properties two, three, four times, and they don't bite, then they have proven behaviorally that they're not motivated. And then you just back off on your efforts. You can still put them on a safe search that meets certain criteria but you're not going to spend as much personal time uh, chasing them. Okay, uh, anybody else who's got a question, a scenario, situation that you'd like some input on? Jeanette? I've got one, Frank. Um, 
I had an open house a couple of Sundays ago and I, a builder approached me and uh, he told me that he was looking for lots in the area. He builds four to eight million dollar houses and he, you know, he'd like a, something large along the size of an acre. Well, you know, in the memorial villages, those are hard to come by. Yes. But to be honest with you, I'm spending a lot of time in prayer these days. And so about two days later, I am on Facebook and I and, and this is just a tip for everybody. There are all those neighborhood groups for sell by owner memorial area real estate join those groups so i am cruising through those groups and a guy pops up and says i have a lot that i'm going to sell it's acre plus it's in the city of houston it's not actually the village but it's surrounded by the village i mean it's just that odd street Perfect. Perfect. and it's beautiful it's beautiful so i'm on it i'm all over this guy and i asked him i said would you be willing to pay the uh, selling brokerage 3%. And he said, absolutely. And I said, okay. And I got it in writing. So I reach out, I go back to this builder and he is shocked to hear from me. Then okay. he starts telling me, I have a relationship with Peggy West. And I said, well, I don't think Peggy West was at the open house. And I didn't hear you approach her and ask her to help you find the lot. And so I said, you know, every good hunter gets to pick more than one good hunting dog. And that's yeah. all I am is I'm just trying to help you. And that's so, but he keeps bringing it up, you know? So anyway, um, we get over there The the owner holds, he has developed some interest. So all the properties were to meet there Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. I went there and met there with this builder guy in tow. We all met there. And there were two other couples that were interested. They were young people. So we tour the property. We go through the whole deal. Well, all this guy does, my the, well, whenever we first get there, uh, the owner says, and who are you? And I said, I'm Jeanette Ram. I had on my tag. I said, I'm Jeanette Ramming with EXP Realty and this is my client. Yes. And I introduced him, you know, nobody says anything, no objections were raised. So he said, okay, you know, and, and then in my ear, the whole time we're looking at this property, this guy is talking about Peggy West. <laughs> I just want to choke him. And then he he's asking me stuff like, Jeanette, how in the world did you find this? My yeah. daughter, I said on social media, he goes, my daughter is so good at social media. So from the time I bring the guy there, all he does is work to cut my legs out from under me. That's all that's in my ear the whole time we're there. So then he waits for me. He said, are you, um, are you about ready to wrap it up? And I said, yeah. Yes. He goes, well, I'm going to speak to the owner. So uh, he couldn't wait to get me out of the way. So um, I kind of hung around for a while. And then Frank, it was just so painfully obvious. I did get in my car and I, I just said to him, I said, well, there's some townhomes that back up to this property. I know you're a little concerned about that. Let me drive around there and see. And I'll tell you, I'll be in touch with you and tell you what I'm finding. I'm even glad to shoot you a video of it. So he doesn't respond. But when I'm leaving, I pass him. And he's telling me it's going to cost three or $400,000 to put in drainage in the city of Houston, blah, blah. Well, I haven't heard back from him. And, and I, I talked to Bob about it. And Bob said, Jeanette, I think you've done all you can do. So Jeanette, you are protected because one of the first things that you said is you got a written agreement with the seller to pay your commission. Yes. Correct. Yes. Did you, did you use the agreement between the registration agreement between broker and owner to do that? No, the only thing I got was an email that where I established it through an email, but I did not send this form to be signed. Okay. So uh, that's probably enforceable. I'm not an attorney, but it, in most, most courts are considering emails to be a form of writing. Um, I would in the future use the form that is designed for exactly this purpose, agreement between broker and owner. Okay. And that way you have it on a promulgated form uh, with signatures and not just an email, which is may be enforceable or may not. This contract form is enforceable. Okay. But okay. any, is, is there anything I need to do, Frank, that I'm not doing so far? So, Jeanette, I think you handled this like a pro. 
the the truth is some people are jerks and uh that sounds like what you're dealing with here and so but 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 knowing that knowing that that's who's out there we have to take proactive measures to protect ourselves and you did that's what i mean you handle this like a pro so you could have gone the other way you could have approached the builder and said i found the perfect property i want to show it to you before we do that i want you to sign a representation agreement with me agreeing to pay me a 3% commission if you purchase the property, if the seller doesn't pay me. You're not gonna disclose the area, the neighborhood details, you're just gonna say uh, it meets the criteria that you established and that, um, and that representation agreement can be limited to, you can write in there, it has a date limit on it, but it could be, but you can write in there, the property to be shown to the buyer on this specific date. Um, okay. And then, and that way, that so the, if the seller wasn't going to pay you, you could talk to the buyer. Either way is sufficient as long as you get something in writing to protect yourself before okay. you make the connection. We have another situation in our company where an agent made a connection. In fact, we're it's, it may go to may go to court. We're we've got attorneys involved already. She introduced the buyer and the builder, and uh, and the buyer went behind her. The builder went behind her they made a deal he purchased the lot which and the lot itself was hundreds of thousands of dollars very similar situation and he's going to build a multi-million dollar custom home, custom home on it she did she had all kinds of documentation six months of relationship but no contracts no representation agreements no registration agreements so it's you know we're, we're working it but our we got one hand tied behind our back if you get okay. the agreements, now you got both fists. You're ready to go. Okay, thank you. You bet, Kevin. Jeanette, thank you for sharing that because that's a real eye opener for all of us. And you know, we see two things. Yes, it's a best practice to use the right forms, as Frank says, either to the potential builder or to the seller of the lot. But at the end of the day, any of these forms are nothing unless you go through the process of trying to enforce them. And if you've got a good email chain, you can pursue that. And the relationships, they know what you said. We take you at your word that you said it just right. They know it too. I would pick up on what Frank said earlier, and that is double down on finding buyers and perhaps run like a KV Core post on, I've got a lot in Memorial, I need other builders. And you go back to Joe Seller and say, hey, by the way, I introduced you to Builder A last week, and now I've got three more builders that are very interested in this lot. Um, let's 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 fish or cut bait and 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 go with Frank's. I got the buyer's deal. Uh, double down. You've got a you've got a pearl in a field, and you need to work it. And <laughs> and uh, don't be discouraged at all by this very obvious human behavior that we're seeing. Um, but yes, have that form handy next time. Either way, have a, have, have a blank, good old pens work. Mr. Seller, let's just fill this out right here, right now. I, I got a pen right here. And let's fill it in. This is the property, the buyer I'm going to introduce you to in the next hour or whatever. And uh, But you're, you're, you've done so much and that's just really awesome. But thank you for sharing it with us this morning. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Kevin. Okie dokies. Well, guys, we've about wrapped up our time. Unless somebody has an urgent question, I do see a green light. Rochelle, what's on your mind? Just a quick question, Frank. Um, is rejecting a VA or um, FHA loan a form of discrimination? I have been told that it is. In when I lived in um, Chicago, I had a townhouse, and our homeowners association used to tell us that all the time. So to answer that question, you have to think about what are the protected classes? And are VA and FHA borrowers in a protected class? Not to my knowledge, certainly not uh, in the identifiable protected classes that are uh, enforceable under fair housing. So there could have been where you lived previously, a local ordinance identifying veterans as a protected group or something of that nature. But uh, no, I've never, ever, ever heard of a case being made for discrimination based upon the type of loan that's acceptable to the seller. 
Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Yes, Lenny. Um, I have a question, um, and it involves the, the commercial lease that I'm working, and I know I'm tired of talking about it, and y'all probably tired of hearing it, but, and, you know, this client A is who I initiated, you know, re representing, um, and through a lot of hoops, a lot of changes, um, evolvement, there is a, 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 a business partner, if you will, that was willing to do us a, a personal guarantee. Uh, and now it's looking like uh, as co-tenants, basically two two te two uh, two names on the on the lease. As as uh, the financial, I guess, uh, stability of each of them is risen to the you know to the top. Tenant B is actually stronger financially than tenant A. So knowing that they didn't qualify for the first property, and now it's looking the second one not. At one point. First of all, I only had representation with the first one, you know, um, and was going to resend all the paperwork or do a separate. That's one question. Do I do an, the whole three forms, IBS and all of those as, as mutual, as two signatures? Or can I have them now that the second tenant is coming into play, just have one individual with him? Yes, uh, it's perfectly <laughs> fine to do individual sets of documents with both tenants. Okay. So... Um, and, and the thing being is that this tenant B, I will, you know, he's looking at land after this, he's looking at land, so I'll be representing him individually. Um, I had a conversation with him yesterday. It's like, I, they're not being transparent because I know that tenant A is, cannot afford it. And I don't real I don't think there's transparency between the two. And my, my caution is tenant A cannot afford it. But I can't tell tenant B because they're friends. They're, you know, that's a discussion that they have to have. And I told so, them. So, Letty, you know, these are going to be co-tenants, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, um, the landlord is going to evaluate the application based mm -hmm. upon the viability of the combined tenants, both okay. of them together, because they're not going to be held responsible individually. I mean, you know, half and half. Mm -hmm. They're both going to be completely responsible for the full amount of the rent. Mm -hmm. And if the landlord is convinced that as a package, they can and will pay the rent, they are approvable. It is mm -hmm. not your place mm -hmm. to reveal confidential information about one partner to another right. partner. Right. It should mm -hmm. not even be a concern. It shouldn't be mm -hmm. on your radar. Uh, mm -hmm. These these are both uh, adults, mm -hmm. professionals, uh, apparently business people looking at commercial property. Mm -hmm. You leave it to their responsibility to decide who they're going to be in partnership with. That's that's their call, not not ours. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome, Letty. Okay. Great questions today uh and good discussion so let's work on on uh, some more for next week as well save up some of these situations that you encounter during the week that you think may have relevance to the rest of the group so that everybody can benefit from that discussion and uh we'll jump into it again but i appreciate y'all coming along uh for coaching call number four uh give me a call anytime i can help you in any way let's go there thanks <laughs> all right bye-bye guys